Hello, everybody, and welcome to this afternoon's webinar. My name is Mike Morneau. I'm with Learning Times. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. And uh, we're going to get started in just a moment's time. Uh, before we get things underway, I just want to remind participants that the webinar is being recorded, and you'll be able to access the recording from the Connecting to Collections Care website in the coming days. Um, if at any point in time you encounter any issues with uh, the audio or perhaps you're not seeing slides advancing, please feel free to let us know in the chat at the lower left of your screen. Without further, uh, further ado, I'm going to go ahead and pass things off to our host, Robin. Go ahead, Robin. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another Connecting to Collections Care webinar. Um, this one is called Basics of Collection Photography, and we're really excited to have everyone here today. Let me start by introducing myself. My name is Robin Bauer Kilgo. I am the coordinator for C2C Care, and you just heard from our producer Mike over at Learning Time. Like I said, like he said, um, if there's you have any issues with audio or anything else, feel free to throw them in the chat. Um, we have learned in these fun times of kids and virtual learning and everyone working from home that sometimes bandwidth gets used a lot in our location. So if you have to and stuff seems to be dragging, um, feel free to re refresh the entire browser. Sometimes that jump starts it. Um, but also, you know, it might be a little laggy, especially if you have, like me, two virtual learners at home. Quick introduction to our website online. It's connectingtocollections.org. Uh, you will find all sorts of fun stuff on that website, including our archives. Archives hold over, gosh, a bunch of webinars. This program has been around since 2010. You can find it on all sorts of subjects. So uh, feel free to do the search if you need to. We also have a really good resources section of different resources that have been collected across the web on all different types of subjects of collections care. So if you're interested in learning about that, please do so. We also have a discussion forum. Our discussion forum um, is a protected area that can be moderated by conservators. So if you have a question concerned with collections care, you can post a question on there. They will go along to our monitors and our conservation experts, and they will get back to you with some really great information. So feel free to click on the Discussions tab, and you will be getting information from there. We also have two homes on social media. We have Facebook.com uh, over at C2C Community. And on Twitter, we are at C2C Care. Uh, both those areas, we post when webinars go up. We post all sorts of fun information on there. So if you're on either one of those platforms, please join us. A quick note about our upcoming calendar. Um, we just did a webinar back on August 26 called Care and Curation of Archaeological Collections for Museum. That one is currently up on our website, connectingtocollections.org. It was a great webinar, and I would encourage anyone, if you have to deal with archaeological collections, to head over there and take a look at it, because it was recorded. On October 21st, we have a, another free webinar coming up. Um, it's called Care of Outdoor Sculptures. We're working on the course description of it right now, but we're going to be having some uh, folks different parts of the country come and talk a little bit about just how they care for outdoor collections and outdoor items. So if you're interested in that, take, please go to our website, and I will put out a nice big notification whenever registration is open. We are also going to be uh, announcing, probably at the end of this week, a course that C2C Care is going to be putting on. The courses, um, we do charge for those, a uh, nominal fee for you to join. It's a series of five webinars that you can be doing through October no to November. The topic is going to be physical media to digital storage, migrating audiovisual files. So if you are like me and at different times you have all sorts of fun different media types floating around back in your collections, things like flash drives, zip drives, I can't remember what else, probably not punch cards, but other types of fun things that media can be on. This course will actually lead you on how to get it into digital storage. Um, oh, and I just saw on, in our chat, someone was asking about our Twitter handle. It's at C2C Care. So if you want to join us on Twitter, head over there. Quick note about our platform. Um, you will see over on the side there is the chat area, which everyone is doing great at. So I won't talk too much more about that. 
basically enter in a phrase you want to say, hit send, and it should be posted. Um, I'll be moderating and keeping an eye on the chat the entire time. So if you have a question during the, our webinar, please feel free to post it there, and I will be sure to keep it for the end of the time. We also have a links area that you can go look at. Within the links area, we have a fabulous uh, bit of resources that our presenter put together for today. So if you're interested in this topic for further, you can click on that. There's also an evaluation link that I will talk about a little bit more at the end of the webinar. Before I go much farther, um, I would like to acknowledge that this webinar is being moderated on the traditional lands of the Miccosukee and Seminole people and their ancestors. I pay my respect to both elders, both past and present, so we want to make sure to acknowledge that. And now I'm going to go ahead and introduce our topic for today, uh, Basics of Collections Photography. Our speaker today is Jennifer McGlinchey Sexton. She is a conservator in private practice in Colorado. She specializes in photographs, works on paper, and conservation imaging. And I'm going to go ahead and hand the mic over to Jennifer. Hi, I'm here. Um, I hope everyone's doing well today. And then I'm going to switch over to my slide, I think. Yeah, so today I'm speaking to you from Colorado Springs, Colorado, which is part of the unceded lands of the Ute, Cheyenne, Hickory, Apache, and Sioux peoples. I would like to acknowledge these tribes and pay my respect to their past, present, and future elders. So thanks for joining today. Uh, as Rob mentioned, I'm a conservator in private practice. Um, I received uh, training in fine art photography before going into conservation. And my conservation training was at the Buffalo Program, where I learned under Dan Cashel. So a lot of what I present and how I practice is informed by that training. Um, I really value practical photography uh, that can be executed quickly, consistently, and professionally. I spent most of my career in private practice or uh, regional centers, so you know, the bottom line tends to be important, and this really informs my practice. So just a brief outline of what I want to go through today. Um, you know, just to begin, this is really an introduction. Photography is a rich subject, so my intent is to introduce some core concepts and give you tools to make decisions about equipment uh, and getting started, or simply to evaluate images that are presented to you. Um, at the end, I'll point you towards some resources to learn more, uh, more in depth on some topics, um, or you can always reach out to me directly, and I'll give you my contact information at the end of the webinar. Um, and I really hope that you will learn some tips to improve your imaging and your decision making about documentation in general. There should be plenty of time for questions at the end of the lecture. Um, so to begin, we'll just talk about some considerations um, when you um, sort of start either a documentation project, a photography project, or just when you're setting up a space. Uh, then we'll talk about some equipment choices, and then how to set up a documentation space and the lighting in particular, then a little bit about archiving files and workflows and the importance of workflows and then some resources at the end. So just some things to consider probably before you get started. Um, definitely the budget you have available so if you need to purchase equipment. Um, that's going to be a, a huge consideration for what you decide to purchase, and then the staffing you have available for photography as well in their time. And then um, the time allotted to either collect the images themselves or the project, if it's um, like an open and shut kind of project, uh, what's its timeline? Um, is there going to be new equipment purchased specifically for this thing to go forward? And um, Mike, do you want to, um, can you just check in about the audio? Does it seem okay? Um, yeah, the audio doesn't sound actually that 
bad for me at all. Uh, are you able to... Uh, it, it does sound a little... A little muffled, but well, muffled isn't even right. Um, there's definitely something there, but um, yeah, if you're wearing a headset, if you just want to move it away from your mouth a little bit. Um, okay, I'll try. Is that any better? Yeah, let's uh, let's give that a try for a bit. Okay. Um, so if your timeline is short, then you might be limited on the amount of changes you can make to your existing setup or the equipment that you could buy. Um, and so the use of the images at the end of the project um, it's really one of the biggest considerations, I would say. So is it for internal use, like for a collections database or for um, conservation documentation? Is it going on the website or is it going in publication? So definitely if it's going to go in a publication, you might need to consider that the quality of the images will have to be higher and that you might need professional uh, either imaging done or professional help to get the images the way that you want them to be. And then another thing is whether you're documenting the condition of the object, so for treatment purposes or conservation documentation, or you're just simply trying to get the information on the artifact itself, so uh, inscriptions, color, um, its appearance. So those are kind of two different goals. Um, not to say that they can't both be done at the same time, but your use is going to inform the kind of pictures that you take. Um, and then again, access is, is going to be important. So if it's difficult to access the materials you need to document, you're, um, you might have to tailor either where the documentation space is or when that uh, documentation occurs. And then size limitations as well. Larger things are going to be much more challenging to document well than small items. And then I, you know, I'm a conservator, so safe handling is really paramount for me. Um, so some things I'm always thinking about, you know, how can we reduce handling of the object? Can it be safely documented, or does it need treatment in order to be fully documented? Uh, there's a number of things to consider here, and I always suggest handling the object as few times as possible, especially if it's unstable. Um, photography can really expressly reduce handling since the photograph can be made accessible more widely than the artifact, so that can be a benefit of documentation. Uh, but I do want to stress that it's important that any staff handling artifacts are trained in object handling. There is real potential for damage during documentation, whether it's by moving it physically to the documentation space or just because you're concentrating on doing something else instead of on the object itself. Um, so safe handling is very important to think about. Um, and then storage, you know, do you have a place to store digital files? Are you going to um, want to access them? How widely are they going to be accessed? And then you um, need to ensure that they can be backed up. So cause the worst thing would be to spend all that time and money taking excellent photographs and then lose them because the server crashed or your uh, hard drive crashed. And so the first thing I really want to talk about is targets. Um, and I want to do that because they're really a valuable tool for documentation. So adding targets to your image is the single most important thing you can do to improve your imaging. They provide known RGB values in the image to assist in exposure and white balance. And these examples on the screen all include a set of neutral patches from black to white. Um, so any of those patches can be used to correct or evaluate white balance. And then equal red, green, and blue numbers when you're measuring with the photo software would indicate a neutral white balance. Um, and so for standardized exposure, usually using one of these gray patches um, for most of the conservation workflows, that would be the second one next to the white um, to get to an RGB value of 200. 
and then you know really including these in, these in targets in your images provide visual indicators of image quality and tools for future viewers to evaluate and understand the images. And so on this slide, there are a few examples of targets. So any visual documentation should include an object identification, so that could be the accession number or just a title and artist of a piece, um, measurement scales, color and gray scales, light angle, and direction indicators, which are a little harder to see, I think, here. but these made for collections imaging, like the ones on the left of the screen, already include all of these um, factors. Um, and they're usually long and thin, so they can be placed alongside the artifact without taking up too much space, too many pixels. And so the color checker passport, which is the one on the right, um, is a little bit more rectangular. It actually folds up. And this can take up a lot of space in your images if you're imaging an artifact, but it, it is still useful because it can be cropped out. You could just leave the gray patches and then a top line of colors in order to mimic um, the conservation targets. But it also can be used to create custom camera profiles um, using free software from X-Ray, which is a company that sells this target. Um, it's also much more widely available than the conservation targets on the screen. So the one on the bottom, the AIC PhD target, is actually no longer being produced in this iteration. Um, Robin Myers has updated it, and it's available on his website now again, but that was only um, very recent. And so just continuing about targets, I won't get too much into um, these guidelines, but um, the Federal Agency's Digitization Guidelines Initiative, which is FEGI, um, is a collaborative effort that was started in 2007 by several federal agencies to communicate sustainable practices and guidelines for digitization. And so this is really um, made in order to Sorry, provide guidelines within these institutions to make sure that their born digital content is up to current standards. And so if you're required to meet these guidelines, you're going to need specialized targets to calibrate your system. And so these are some examples of this. And so specialized object level and device level targets are used and usually compared and evaluated using software. Uh, so the device level targets allow performance measurements over a, li a large field of view, and they measure illumination, uniform uniformity, spatial distortion, and resolution variability, just to ensure quality control. And so the object level targets can be included with the artifact itself to make sure that they conform to that same standard over time. And so there are tiers of requirements that might be in place in institutions or for contrast-based work. And they ensure that the equipment is calibrated to create images that are very consistent and also up to current standards. Uh, so, But if you're required to conform to these standards with your collection photography or, or specific project, you might consider additional training in using these targets and the software that would streamline the evaluation of your system but it's really beyond the scope of this webinar. So I want to move in to start talking about some cameras, and I'm not going to talk about all the cameras that are possible to use, obviously. Um, I just want to talk about some of the most common ones. And, you know, of course, there are other options like medium format or even film cameras, but Really, I'm talking about digital cameras and uh, digital single leg, single lens reflex cameras, which are digital SLRs, are probably the most commonly used. Um, but I do just want to, you know, talk about a little bit about phone photography or mobile mobile device photography, and then also mirrorless cameras, which can be a good alternative from an, a digital SLR because they can be lightweight and 
and there's really a lot of innovation happening in that um, industry right now. Um, so this diagram shows sort of like a X-ray weird view of a digital SLR, and so this would be um, the camera body and then the camera lens. So the lens on these types of cameras is going to be interchangeable, but I won't get too much into the mechanics of this camera um, or you know how to use a specific camera because it's going to change a lot depending on which camera you ultimately use. So what I want to do instead of getting into specifics about, like for example, this Canon, I want to talk about what you're looking for when you're buying a camera and, and why. And so the first thing I want to talk about is the sensor size. So there are a few things, like terms, just to talk about here. So APS-C is one size, full frame is another sensor size, and then a mobile device might have variable sensor size, um, and I'll just show you some examples of that. But image quality is usually indicated by megapixels, um, and so this is calculated just really by the amount of pixels um, in the area, and then that's communicated to you in megapixels. Um, but that's not really the whole picture, so you need to also consider the sensor size. Is my animation here? There it is. Um, so this is not to scale, obviously, because I can't control the size of your screen, but um, the largest square would be the full frame sensor, so that's going to be the, the largest sensor of the DSLRs that we're going to talk about. Um, this full frame just essentially means that, that it's the size of 35 millimeter film, so it's not giant by any measurement, but it's full frame as, as far as that, that SLR um, history goes. And then the next smallest square is the APS-C sensor, so those are more compact sensors, and you'll see those on you know, smaller digital SLRs or uh, cheaper digital SLRs for sure, and some of the mirrorless cameras as well. And then I just threw in just, you know, this is to scale to each other, but the iPhone sensor is going to be a lot smaller than, for example, a full frame. So if you have a choice between a full frame digital SLR or your iPhone, this is just one way to talk about how the digital SLR will be able to capture more information because its sensor is physically bigger. And so even though they might have the same number of megapixels, like you, you know, if your iPhone has 8 megapixels, you could have an older digital SLR that also has 8, eight megapixels. And there are definitely some things to consider um, about the quality of each one. Um, the amount of pixels in the iPhone is, is going to be shoved into a smaller area than on the full frame. So in general, it's bigger to ha it's better to have a bigger sensor, even if, though it might have slightly smaller megapixels if it's an older generation. So that um, I hope that's clear. To everyone we can talk about that a little bit later. I don't want you to get too caught up in this sort of like uh, megapixel diagram. I just want you to understand the difference between the sensor sizes, and so just getting that megapixel number is not always the full picture. And so comparison tools can be really valuable. And so this website um, is what I use to evaluate cameras. It's called Digital Photography Review. Um, and it tends to be a, a relatively unbiased um, way to compare cameras. And they also post reviews. And there's camera buying um, guides that, you know, I guess you could take with a, a grain of salt. But what I like the most is the side-by-side -side comparison tool. So you can select a number of cameras that you're considering purchasing, and it puts all of the relevant information right next to each other, and you can compare those. So you'll get very clear information about the sensor size. You'll get clear information about the sensor size, um, the amount of pixels, and it's less um, sort of mumbo jumbo from the advertisers. And then um, it does allow you to make choices based on your budget. 
and then what what you're trying to look for, and you can compare those directly to each other. And so there's a lot of things to consider when you're doing photography. And so I, I won't go that much into specifics. We'll talk about it a little bit when we get to workflows. But just some things that are just quick and dirty tips to help you improve um, your documentation. So for your camera settings, definitely consider buying a camera that has an ability to use manual exposure, even though you might not use it, having that ability um, indicates that the camera can do that if you need it to. And then you always want to get your ISO as low as possible. And so for most cameras, it's going to be between 100 and 200 ISO. So you can certainly have a wide range of, of ISO. A lot of cameras nowadays will go up very, very high. But um, there's always a trade-off for that, so they'll end up being more noise or um, less ability to render um, gray values. So you can sort of hack any camera by getting the ISO as low as possible to reduce noise. Uh, and then for f-stop, when you're choosing your exposure, you can um, just try to maximize the lens that you have. And so it's usually sharpest at the middle of its f-stop range, so that is usually for most lenses f8 or f11. Um, I recommend shooting in raw capture because that gives the most post-processing abilities and less uh, compression of your images. So having a camera that can shoot in raw is really important. So um, even if you don't use the raw images, having that ability is, is valuable if you're purchasing new equipment. Uh, and then the ability to save custom white balances either through the software or right in the camera is, is really valuable, especially if you have to move your documentation space so you don't just have one space dedicated to documentation. And then tethered capture, which would be essentially your, your computer is attached to the camera and you bring that, that system in there in order to capture the images, uh, can really help with evaluation of of photographs, um, which can improve the results. So you can evaluate very quickly whether your exposure is off or your focus is off in order to um, make decisions before you have to put the object away. Um, just a quick note about exposure. So um, I'm a big fan of auto exposure mode, especially aperture priority. This is just one exposure mode in most cameras. So that means you set the aperture and then the camera decides what the shutter speed is. It's sort of an auto exposure mode, um, but a little bit more intelligent. Um, these can be real useful for, you know, quickly getting a good exposure, but they only do one thing. So the only thing an auto exposure mode will do is expose your image to 18% gray. Um, which is sort of like most of the gray I'm using for the background here. Um, and so most of the artifacts that you're going to be photographing are probably not 18% gray. They might be more black or they might be more white. So the camera is going to either over or underexpose them because it's trying to get them to equal 18% gray. So you do have to make some exposure adjustments often uh, when using auto exposure modes but um, it can help get, get you a little bit closer um, in order to shorten the time that you need, um, or you can just use straight manual and um, evaluate your images as you go using that color checkers. And again, just some quick and dirty tips just talking about lenses. Um, and so, you know, fixed lenses tend to be better quality than zoom lenses. Just in general, the zoom lenses have more moving parts. It's going to be harder to um, reduce chromatic or physical aberrations. Um, so if you're concerned about sharpness or image quality, you might uh, consider selecting a fixed lens and using that, but if you're more concerned about flexibility, then zoom lenses are really valuable for that. 
wide angle lenses in general tend to have a lot more distortion. So I would avoid definitely using a super wide angle or even a super telephoto um, lens, which is, is obviously less, less useful in this application. But the wide angle lenses, you might need them if you're photographing something that's very large. And there are some tools to correct that, but it, there is a trade-off in image quality as well. And then if you're really interested in comparing lenses in order to get the best quality, there are tools to do that, and they're called MFT graphs. And you can usually find them um, for the specific lenses that you're looking at. And, and so learning how to read those MFT graphs and compare them can help you uh, choose your lenses with more sophistication. Um, and then just some more general tips, you know, using as much light as is safe for the subject is always going to help. So more light is going to equal less noise, shorter exposure. Um, but you don't want to overexpose your object, especially if you're using older style lights that might be giving off heat, for example. And then use an established workflow or create a workflow in order to get your documentation consistent. So that means consistent when you come back to take a photograph of something else or your colleagues are photographing in the same space or different parts of the collection. Um, so you know you can always start with a workflow that's been created by someone else, but it almost always needs to be tailored for, for your specific system and setup because your camera might be different. It's going to have different menus or different buttons. Um, could be just a different model, um, same thing with the, um, your lighting, your documentation setup, and then the software and post-processing. And then, you know, I said it before on the slide about targets, but always include a color reference in your images. So even if you crop it out later, you know, whether you're putting on the website or um, putting in the collections database and you don't want it to have the target in it, that's fine, but the archival file should retain that call reference because over time it will become valuable to, you know, the next generation of people looking at this image. So, I want to talk a little bit about software. You know, I'm not um, a, trying to be a salesperson for Adobe Photoshop because, you know, obviously it has limitations as well and it's not free, but it is a standard software that is well known. Um, and there are a lot of workflows for conservation documentation that are available on this platform, even though it's probably on older versions. Um, it does save a lot of time and simplifies processing. Um, and then if you need support, it's readily available. There's also a lot of training available for using Photoshop. Um, it's now moved to this online subscription system, um, which reduces the upfront cost of the software, but obviously you have to continue to pay it over time in order to continue to use the software. Um, there are other options, of course. So Lightroom is also an Adobe product. It's just a different way of dealing with the files. Uh, capture One is another well-known both capture software and um, processing software. That's also not free, but um, is favored by um, photographers using higher-end systems. Um, Adobe Photoshop Express is free, but you're limited on what you can do with that system. Um, there's an open source sort of uh, Photoshop-like system called GIMP. And then ImageJ is also another open source image processing software that has different goals, but can do a lot of the things that Photoshop can do. Um, if you just need a raw processor, there's one called Raw Therapy that's free and widely available. Um, you know, any of the software that you use is going to require a little bit of uh, time to get to know what that software can do and then possibly some training depending on, you know, what kind of level of documentation or pro processing you have to do. So you, you really need to consider what your computer can actually do when thinking about this as well because if you're 
computer can't run Adobe Photoshop, then it doesn't make sense for you to subscribe to it. And so you might either have to consider an upgrade to your computer when you're, you know, budgeting for your project or um, consider another type of software that you can run or maybe um, limit the post-processing that can be done. So just getting into some lighting. And so these are some common lighting or common lights available or types of lights mainly. So these aren't, I'm not um, necessarily advocating for these brands, although these are well-known brands. Um, I just want, these are examples of the types. So it used to be that most of the lights we would see would be fluorescent or this tungsten halogen lights. And so the fluorescent ones are those large banks. Um, and you can get daylight balance ones of those. And then the tungsten halogen bulbs are the ones that emit a, lot, a ton of heat, but are sort of well-known photo lights. Um, and so on the bottom are the newer style. So LED, you can either see as this panel or as a more traditional looking light. And so the LEDs are just sort of inside that uh, light housing, even though it might look like a bulb with an ounce an LED bulb. So they have a lot of um, differences between these types of lights, and I don't want to get into too much about that, but LEDs are really taking over this market. And so you're going to see the LEDs um, are going to be cheaper and more widely available than even the fluorescent bulbs now, or but definitely the tungsten halogen bulbs. And there's some good reasons for this. Um, mainly the LEDs use a lot less energy than previous bulbs, but um, also they produce less heat and they can be targeted more towards the visible range, which is what we need. Uh, the tungsten halogen lamps, for example, put out um, a lot of infrared and that's what results in that heat that we can experience when we're photographing with them. Um, the LEDs will come with different color temperatures as well, and so they can be tuned to anything, and sometimes you can get them so you can tune them on your own. Um, most photo lights will aim towards about 4,000 or 5,000 K to get close to, you know, natural sunlight. Um, and the actual color temperature is less important than your consistently consistency in color temperature. So if you have existing lights, you might want to match those as well as you can. Um, it's always best to get, you know, your whole suite of lights at the same time so they're as consistent as they can be because lights will age over time and their color temperature might change. Um, but if you need to match lights, you could get a tunable LED lamp, for example, but that can be a little bit challenging to get accurate. Um, another option between the lights that you might see is continuous versus flash. And so continuous lights means that the light stays on at the same intensity all the time. You take your picture and you manually turn off, on and off the light when you're done, essentially. And then for a flash, it's, it might have a modeling light, so you might have a, a, like a, a low light on all the time, but basically it flashes a bright light during your exposure so that it's timed with the camera capture and you can reduce exposure for the object, but also the light itself can be brighter. So that can be helpful if you're working in a un more uncontrolled environment. You can get those lights to be a little bit brighter. So when choosing lights, the most important thing to consider is the color rendering index value. So this is usually abbreviated as CRI. Um, and this is really the ability of the light to reproduce color when compared to natural light, like the sun. Um, and so that's considered the ideal light source. And you know, light sources with a high CRI are critical with acumen, accurate documentation of color. And so just as a shorthand, above 90 is usually considered a good match. And then below 80 is a poor match. And so in the graphic here, you can see that the child 
see the orange color instead of the red color, which is what the apple is supposed to appear like. So you won't get um, good fidelity of colors with um, a light with low CRI. And you might actually get some weird um, effects, sometimes known as metamerism, where things match in, under one set of lights and then they don't match under another. Um, which can be a real uh, frustrating phenomenon in conservation. But by choosing something with a high CRI, you can um, get as close to that sort of natural white light as you can to ensure color fidelity. So there are accessories to consider when you're getting lighting. And so depending on the light system that you purchase, it probably has their own proprietary attachments. And so these ones are all from ProPhoto, which um, is a good company, and they have a lot of uh, light shaping attachments, but obviously not the only example. And it needs to be able to fit on your light. Um, and so the examples here are going to be the soft box, which I'll talk about a little bit when we get into lighting orientations. Soft boxes are very valuable to get your lighting more diffuse. Um, so for three-dimensional objects, it's a sort of necessary or anything that's relatively shiny. Um, I photograph with a soft box for everything. Um, it's a really good way to just get the lighting a little bit more diffuse and more even. Um, and then there's also barn doors, um, and that allows you to close down the light or direct it. In a specific way, and I'll show you an example of using that for capturing texture of surfaces. Um, and then reflectors can be helpful because it's another way to broaden the amount of light um, and then also direct it more towards where you want it to go. So it's less going around the room, more going towards the direction that you want it to go. And so Setting up a documentation space, we'll just get into some of this right now. Again, this is just very general. You definitely want to be able to control the light. So if you're in an open lab area, you need to find a way to reduce ambient light. So can you block off the space that you're working in, or can you turn off the overhead lights, for example? Um, diffuse lighting is definitely best for almost every type of artifact you might want to be documenting, although there's definitely situations where you might want directed light, just generally diffuse light is more useful. Backgrounds are important, you know, for any type of publication or professional looking photography, you want the uh, background to, to look good, certainly. But they can also, you know, assist you with exposure. So a gray background will help you get to that 18% gray. So it will help the camera decide what a good exposure is. So that's one reason why you see a lot of gray in documentation spaces, because the camera wants to see 18% gray. So the closer your surroundings are to that, the more it can make uh, good decisions about exposure. Um, but there's other reasons that gray can be helpful. So on the bottom, I just took in um, one of my sort of collections artifacts. Um, and photograph it with different colored backgrounds. And so the middle is that sort of 18% gray or maybe a little lighter. And then on the left is black and on the right is white. And so I want you to sort of look at those a little bit back and forth and see how the contrast of the object itself is changed by the color of the background. So with the white background, the edges of the object kind of blend in a little bit. So anything that might have white edges is going to sort of blur into the background a little bit. And likewise, the one with the black background, the, the contrast is sort of enhanced. Um, and so that might not be a helpful representation of the object, or it might be helpful. So it depends on what that object is. Something that is um, partially transparent might look um, odd with a black background, for example. So for just a generic background, gray can be a really good choice. Um, as for what those backgrounds are made of, there's um, definitely some options. There are um, 
gray paints available, so you can paint your background um, with acrylic paint, and that can be a really good and flexible option. Uh, you can buy photo-specific backdrops, usually that pull down um, sort of fabric or paper. Uh, you can use paper itself. You can get gray papers. Um, I've used foam core, black foam core in particular. Um, there's also gray formica that can be really useful if you're setting up a coffee stand, for example. Um, and getting those as close to neutral gray as you can is helpful because it, it helps, again, with that uh, not only the appearance, but getting that right exposure. But it's not it's not critical that it be 100% neutral gray, um, although there are those there are those available. But definitely avoid colored backgrounds because it can be distracting, and it can also cause color casts on the object if they have any reflections or if they're light colored in particular. Some things to think about, so the stability of the camera itself. So this is usually achieved with a tripod or a camera stand. So the camera stands are, would be the higher end option for that, but potentially um, have more uh, flexibility and a tripod is more flexible and probably already available in your institution. Um, thinking about the orientation of what you're photographing, is it two-dimensional or is it three-dimensional? Those are different types of photography spaces. Maybe you need both, um, so you can find a way to, to make them both work. But if you just need 2D, for example, it can be a little bit easier than 2D or just um, 2D and 3D or just 3D. Um, so again, just some tips for 2D work. So that would be like photographing paintings or uh, works on paper that are relatively flat or, or objects that are relatively small and flat. Um, definitely you want the parallel plane, so that means the camera is parallel to the subject as much as is reasonably possible. And then usually two or more lights. Um, most orientations you're going to want probably be two lights, one on either side. One light is going to be really limiting and you're going to um, have a lot of challenges with uh, reflectance and then getting even uh, throughout the whole field. I think it's really important to have a flexible orientation in order to document things of different sizes and um, with different characteristics. So setting it up so that it's flexible can save you a lot of headache later on. Um, if there's something you didn't consider coming in. Um, and then think about ways to reduce reflections. So reflections are going to come from the windows or the walls or something else that might be in the room. So that's, again, why we talked about you know, the things in photo documentation spaces are usually painted gray or black. So that matte dead black um, is going to help reduce reflections from the wall that might change uh, the color temperature of your space or might show up in places that you don't want it to be if there is something that has uh, reflective surfaces. So this is my studio. I'm sitting at this table right now talking to you. This is um, my 150 square foot conservation lab at my home in Colorado. So you'll notice it's not painted gray and it's not ideal. Um, one thing that I learned is that don't like don't get started on your project in that space until you painted it. Because now I have art in here, I can never I can't paint because I can't uh, expose the artwork to the paint because <laughs> I don't have another space right now. So I can't paint the space until I have um, another room to sort of move into. But another thing I want to talk about is that. Um, you know, I have control of the lights here. I put a blackout uh, curtains on the windows, and there's no one else working here. So it, it can be real, pretty flexible. Um, and then the color of the walls is sort of not super critical all the time. But some, I have had cases where I photograph uh, things with glass on them, for example, and I'll see the reflection of the walls. And so if my walls were painted black, I wouldn't have that problem. And so um, this is a small space, but I've made it to be flexible. And so I just want to talk a little bit about the orientation of the copy stand. 
in particular because that's where I, where I will start. Um, and so this is my setup, which is a copy stand. And then this is just a schematic of a copy stand. So for 2D materials, a copy stand can be really valuable. So this is a gener general schematic of what that looks like. So it's used for flat paper or, uh, you know, paintings that can be laid down and then small or flat objects. And so the camera shoots down. The camera's oriented on top of the subject. And then this lighting arrangement um, is for normal light. So there's two lights and are at like a 20 to 25 degree angle from the subject. And so the most important thing that makes a copy stand so useful, I think, in my, in my practice, is that the camera and the subject are parallel to each other because my table is, is parallel and my camera is parallel. And that's what sort of speeds up the photography in general. So you can put your object there, your camera's already in place, or you can, I mean, it comes up and down sometimes. But in general, it's a much easier way to photograph flat objects because everything's already in parallel. And then the light. are flexible. So in this case, I can turn off one light and then move one light down so it's at a, more of a 10 degree angle and I can get that raking light orientation. And so here in this example, I've closed down the barn door so there's like a split of light coming onto the subject and that's how we get that um, closer to point source that we need for a raking light and I'll just show an example of what that means. So on the right is this raking light of this uh, print versus the normal light. And so what we're seeing here is really the paper morphology. So you can see um, the paper's not perfectly flat. And then also you can see that the impression from the original uh, printing is there as well. And that's information that's not captured in that normal light orientation. But the normal light orientation gives us a better view of the image itself. So if that's your value for this image, then maybe you only need normal light. Um, and so um, for raking light, uh, for conservation documentation is really critical. Often, you know, for this example, this print was probably washed and flattened, so the raking light image was really important to capture that condition, but that might not always be the goal of your photography. Um, and so for lights on the copy stand, there are a lot of options. And so the most common would be having just freestanding photo lights, which are on stands, and that can be moved around as you need them. It's will take up more space on the floor. Or you can have ceiling mounted lights, and that's the big example in my studio I showed you. They're mounted on the ceiling on a, a rail. Um, and then this example also shows some soft boxes. So I have soft boxes on mine. Like I said, it can help um, giving you more diffuse light, which is almost always um, preferable to um, more directed light. There are other options as well. And so on the left here, this is like a ready-made copy stand that you can buy and has the lights already integrated into the system. And so these can be helpful as like a one-stop shopping kind of situation, but they are very limited in size. So if you're photographing anything, I would say it's larger than that 16 by 20 that's relatively flat. Um, you're not going to be able to document it very well with a ready-made copy stand like this. Uh, for one, the platform is not big enough, um, although you can extend that you know, manually. Um, the problem really is you can't get, the lights, can't get the lights far enough away, so having those lights separated can be really valuable and give you more flexibility and orientation. And then on the right, um, this example is from Cultural Heritage Imaging for capturing RTI, which we won't talk about today. But this is just, you know, anywhere you can get the camera to shoot down, you can photograph onto the floor, and that's essentially a copy stand. But you can imagine that this setup it's going to take a lot longer for you to set up than a copy stand that's already in place. Um, and so if time is a consideration, then a copy stand can help save quite a bit of time. 
So another way to photograph 2D materials uh, would be with an easel. So this is the setup at the Gulf of State Conservation Lab. Um, and, and, you know, most um, conservation studios, this is what you'll see, especially if they're photographing primarily easel painting. And so the easel is on one wall, and then you're photographing through straight on to that. But it's essentially the same orientation. So the camera and the subject are parallel. The lighting is about 20 to 25 degrees. And then adding those soft boxes can be helpful to reduce shadows um, and it gives you more diffuse lighting. Um, and so this this diagram is sort of seen from the top. So the subject is on the easel, like maybe on the wall, and then the camera is parallel to that, pointed towards the wall. Um, that 20 to 25 degree angle can be really helpful um, to reduce reflections on the surface of objects like a paint, like varnish paintings or things that are um, glazed because um, the light is not bouncing right back into the camera. So 45 degrees, which I think some people think about as like the perfect orientation to get even lighting, is actually the best way to get reflections from the surface. So um, try to think about that sort of smaller angle um, with the lights sort of a little bit closer to the subject and off to the side to reduce reflection. So moving on um, to 3D material. So the easiest way to capture 3D material is on a table. And again, this example is from that the Buffalo State, um, our conservation documentation lab, which is, in my opinion, one of the most flexible and beautifully designed studios. But obviously, we don't all have that. Um, you know, but this can be set up in any, any, any space that's sort of large enough depending on your object. And so the idea is you have your camera, you know, set up on the tripod or the stand, and then your object is on a table. And so in order to achieve that um, gray backdrop, a lot of people will use like um, those photo-specific backdrops that can be rolled up. Um, and so that's sort of what I'm trying, trying to show with this diagram. And so the subject is sort of resting on that and the backdrop um, is rolled up behind there, so there's no scene. Um, and so you shoot towards the object face on. Um, there's a lot of variables here. The object itself could be rotated, or it could be put on a turntable to rotate. Or your camera could be up and shooting down at an angle in order to get more of a perspective shot. And then just to see that from another angle is, would be as if you were seeing that view from above um, to show you where the light could go. Um, and so you see that sort of seamless gray backdrop and then um, diffuse lighting from the soft boxes. It's, for 3D materials, it's really critical to have the ability to put a soft box on your light, even if you don't use it every time. Um, you're going to have uh, more variable lighting angles here with three dimensional objects. That depends on you know how many, uh, how much texture it has, or how three-dimensional it is, or what it is you're trying to capture. Um, so in general, um, the lights tend to be closer to the camera in order to get that lighting as close on to the front as you can to reduce shadow. Um, and so the turntable, so putting the object itself on a turntable allows you to move the object and keeping it in the same relative space so that you can capture all sides without having to move the object physically or move your camera. And then again, that perspective shot is a camera from above the subject and pointed down. Just to illustrate that seamless back background, so the idea is that there's no uh, horizon line behind the subject. It's just that sort of straight. Either, in this case, they're both paper, but you could be fabric. Um, or a painted um, plastic. Uh, this example just shows um, the setup at the Shakespeare Birth Place Trust, which is in the UK. And so they have this coffee stand, and then that's used to collect things that are two dimensional, but they also have this more flexible thing that looks like, you know, it's maybe in someone's workspace where the backdrop can roll down. And then probably those same lights are brought in. Um, and then the camera shoots through straight on. 
And so I like this illustration. I just wanted to talk about the flexibility here. So, you know, a copy scan can be used as an object table if you have the ability to drop down that seamless backdrop. Um, for example, you can use the same lighting. You don't have to have um, different spaces or different equipment in order to achieve two different things. And then you might just consider that your object might need more than one angle to document it completely, or depending on what it is you're trying to document. This is just an example of a book, which you know has two very specific ways to document it. Straight down will give me information about the actual book, uh, the pages. If I open this, I could photograph each page and uh, have a good document of, of those parts of the book, but there's no information at all about the spine or the thickness of the book. Um, but taking the camera, for, so if the one on the left is captured with a cop stand, I took the camera off and put it on um, my tripod and I photographed it from above down like a perspective shot, then I can capture more information about the spine and its physicality as a book. I want to talk about metadata just briefly, just to highlight its importance and then some things you might want to think about um, in order to create accurate documents of what you've done. And so the, the camera will automatically collect some data. So the date and the time that you took the photograph, as long as if your camera had the right date and time, um, those will be captured and then your camera make a model, your exposure, um, the resolution, all these things will be automatically captured usually by your camera and recorded in the file property. So if you have a software that can read metadata, you'll be able to see that. In this case, this is uh, Adobe Bridge. Um, but there's a lot of information that is missed. And so I recommend that you add your um, metadata of what you did. And so this is just an example of things that I add. And so the creator that, you know, you write your name and your contact information that can be written right into the file. The lighting and the orientation, so perhaps the type of lights that you used, their orientation, so that might be the angle from the subject or just the height from the floor, um, whether or not you use the soft box, for example. Uh, information about the subject that you documented that can help someone else understand the image later on. And if you use camera filters, so for certain types of photography, you might use filters or you might use a polarizing filter, for example, that's not going to be recorded um, automatically, that, so you should write that in, that you did that. Um, and, and really the goal is to record anything that might help you or another user repeat the setup or understand the image. And so for conservation documentation, it's always before and after, so you want those to match as much as possible. So you're telling yourself or someone else how to photograph that later and how to set up that scene. Um, there are templates available, and then um, I usually add this information into the IPTC core uh, section under description, um, which is outlined in the AIC Guide to Digital Photography and Conservation Documentation, which I'll talk about later. When choosing file formats in arch when, when choosing file formats for archiving, you want to ensure that they have universal accessibility. So the idea is to avoid any proprietary files. And so for raw files, you know, each manufacturer is going to have their own proprietary file ending, for example. This is Canon CR2, Nikon would be NEF. And so the one that's created for archiving purposes is it was made by Adobe and it's called Digital Negative, so it's .dng. And it's considered to be more accessible and it is expressly created to be archival. So for long-term storage, um, in theory, that file will be more accessible, you know, 10 or 20 years from now. Uh, likewise, for um, more archival file types, so raw files are helpful because they retain a lot more information that came out of the camera. But for archiving, you probably want to save it as something that can be readable by more users, so that would be a TIFF. Um, 
for image files and then DNG and then PDF for maybe documents that might include images, for example. So JPEG is really good for sharing, but the images are compressed, so it's not an archival format if you're trying to retain as much information as possible. So the TIFF would be the unarchived um, most readable file created. And then the raw file, which is that digital negative, retains more information um, for specialized users if they want to use that later on. Workflows are really valuable because they provide consistency not only between, again, your future self, um, but, uh, you know, within uh, a group that might be working together. And so the typical elements of a workflow are going to be the setup of the documentation space and the lighting, the camera settings, so that would be the white balance, your ISO, and your exposure mode. All the capture settings, this is going to change depending on what it is exactly you're photographing, but, you know, f-stops, um, shutter speed, um, all, all these things that you're going to think about every time you take a picture and how you make those decisions, um, whether you're shooting to that um, 200 value on the, the color checker or your, how you're white balancing, for example. And then post-processing. This could be very complicated post-processing or very straightforward or simple post-processing. And then file naming. Um, it's important to have a system in place for file naming, especially if you're embarking on a project because you don't want to end up with, um, you know, just the automatic sequence, for example, that has no meaning or, you know, photo one, photo two, photo three. That's not going to be valuable in a month from now when you, you can't remember what order you did things. So, Setting up the file name protocol in the workflow or ahead of time is really valuable, saves time. And then how those files will be stored. So again, local storage of, of files can be challenging because they don't, you don't have access in other part of the building, for example, or if that computer is corrupted, then you lose that, all that work that you've done. And so I included some examples of workflows in the resources document that you can download. And so there's one that was recently published by the Library of Congress, which is very, um, very specific. It's specific to their equipment as well, but it can be really helpful as like a template for setting up your own. And then, of course, um, the AIC guide to conservation documentation includes examples of workflows as well. Even though they might be a little out of date, they still have all the sort of steps that you need to consider. And then, you know, just again, this is just an overview. So I just want to talk about some common issues that I see, and then I can get some feedback from you. We'll have, we'll have some time for questions. Um, and so, if one of your issues is color accuracy or exposure, which I believe, you know, are tied and can be um, fixed with the same tools, um, you know, definitely use that imaging target inside your image, included in every image, even if you crop it out later. Um, if you're really struggling with that as well, you can add color profiles, and that can be made using that X-ray passport I showed in the beginning. Um, and you can learn about that on X-ray's website. It's very straightforward to do. Um, and then ensure that your lights are high CRI. So if you're not sure, um, try to just figure out the model and the manufacturer, and you should be able to look that up very quickly. If you're purchasing new lamps, make sure, again, like aiming for 95 is a good number, but definitely above 90. Um, you'll never get good color accuracy if with so low CRI lamps. And then, so if your problem is uneven lighting and shadows, you try to allow for flexibility in where your lights can be and where your camera can be. Um, and so that means maybe the lights can move up and down, for example, make different angles or move further out um, away from the subject. Um, this is really valuable if you have reflective surfaces as well because you're essentially just trying to move the reflection from that surface off, you know, off the object itself so it doesn't go back into the camera. Um, if you're really limited in your lighting angles especially, or if you have very reflective surfaces, polarizers can be really helpful. So that's essentially um, 
a filter that goes on your camera and then um, a film that goes over your lamp that allows you to control the, uh, the way the light comes out of the lamp and the way it goes into your camera so you can reduce reflections that way. Um, you have a little bit of a trade-off with um, the image quality because it does increase saturation a little bit. So for conservation documentation, it can be um, a little challenging. Um, if you have something that's oversized, um, consider that you might need more than one image to document that, um, or more than one lamp, or more than two lamps, especially, in order to get the lighting even. Um, it almost always helps to move the lights further away from the subject. Um, and so if you're having issues with file naming, establish a protocol and process your images as soon as possible, like while you're working um, can be really helpful because um, you don't forget the information. If you document everything and do all the file naming and processing um, either that day or during that session, then um, you've captured as much as you can. And so we have a poll now. So I, um, we can have time for questions, but I wanted to know if you guys could give me some feedback about your biggest challenges in collection photography, and maybe we can talk about um, results of this poll after you have a few minutes to do it. Okay. The time looks like it's a clear winner, but insufficient equipment is right behind there and training. Okay. So just some things, final thoughts from me. Um, if you are setting up a studio um, for documentation or setting up a project, definitely prioritize your purchases. So, you know, there are things, basic needs, and then there are things that are nice to have. So the basic needs are camera, lighting, and target. Uh, I don't, um, there's obviously a lot more money that can be spent. You can get a lot more tools, you can get more training as well, but those are the, the basics that you need. And so if you can space out um, purchases over time, for example. Um, it's a very low cost item, but the AIC Guide to Digital Photography and Conservation Documentation is extremely valuable. So if you don't purchase anything to improve your setup, just getting this book and having it uh, available to you as a reference can be um, very helpful. And so this is a third edition, which you can get as a PDF from AIC's website, um, which was updated fairly recently. Obviously, the digital things get out of date relatively quickly, but the core concepts um, are of photography and um, documentation of collections is really well articulated in this book. And so if you want to learn more information about what I've talked about or any, um, any of these specific, any photography subject, you can learn it in this book, or it can point you towards more resources. And then just some suppliers that I talked about. Um, I got a lot of my photo equipment from VNH Photo, which is out of New York City. Um, and then for Targets, x right AIC, we used to sell um, the Targets through AIC, but they're not available there anymore. So they're at Rob Myers Imaging. And then Image Science Associates is another option for those as well, especially the um, higher end targets for the FADU requirements. And then this is my contact information. Um, and I hope you had time to download that handout. I gave you about some resources, and there's time for questions now uh, that hopefully you guys have been up to on the chat. Thanks so much, Jennifer. That was a lot of great information. Um, I know someone earlier in the chat was basically saying this is like a whole job unto itself. And I was like, agreed, <laughs> like just doing collections photography is a really uh, separate skill set that I've always been fascinated with. And it's 
really interesting to kind of hear what kind of what information you had to relay. So I'm going to let um, people kind of fill out the chat a little bit. I have some questions that we can go through, and we have about 15 minutes to do that. But I wanted to start off with asking kind of a, a general question, which was when it comes to that basic photo setup you showed or you talked about, like lights, backgrounds, and stuff, how much do you think that would cost, just generally, like a ballpark, to get something set up within your institution? Like with a copy scan kind of thing? or just Yeah. Maybe? Yeah, like coffee stand or even just like when you have to get the background, the lights, and just if you wanted something that, you, let's say you're working at a mid-sized institution and someone asks you, hey, we want to set you up something, but you had to give them like a ballpark figure, that it would cost. I mean, I'd say you could do a lot with like $3,000. Um, it could be definitely more than that. Um, and possibly less, depending, you know, on the size, I guess, and, and if you had, like, an in-house, like, fabricator. I, um, one of the best things about my setting up my practice is that my dad is a carpenter, so he set up my um, copy stand setup, which I bought in components. And so I got a copy stand column that's affixed to the wall, and then I got a table that's just, just a table, and then the lights, um, I got separately as well. So it wasn't like a one-stop shopping at all, but uh, because I had someone who was able to help me install those things, I was able to do that, and not everyone has that um, ability. So I'd say if you had some fabrication help, then you can keep uh, costs down a little bit. And probably the most expensive thing you will buy is the camera, you know, depending on on what kind of resolution you're looking for. The copy stand in my practice is it makes money. So it saves time, you know, it, it costs me that amount of money to, to build it, but it saves so much of my time that I have more time to, to do things that make money. Does that make sense? Oh, totally. No, I understand. Sometimes you have to like front load it almost, knowing, you know, that that eventually this will kind of pay for itself. That that totally we did have a question, or actually real quick, before we change subjects. It says, someone has just posted in the chat, if you're working on a budget, it might be worth searching places like Craigslist for a used copy stand. Uh, this person got lucky and bought an excellent one for about 100 bucks 10, 10 years ago. So, you know, I bet eBay yeah, might have absolutely. stuff like that as well. Um, so one question we have posted in there. Oh, go ahead. Well, I also think about what you are, might already have. Like, for example, if you're doing a copy stand and you and you have the column, but you don't have a table, like maybe your flat files can be the table, for example, uh, something like that. Or, you know, and I, I got my flat files on Craigslist. So eBay, I got, um, I've gotten lots of equipment on eBay as well. Yeah, now people are trading stories on how they've built copy stands. So it's kind of fun to kind mm -hmm. of see how people kind of cobble together stuff, which is what you always end up doing. Um, so someone says, it has been suggested at my institution that for works on paper, we can use an overhead scanner as opposed to photography. Any helpful thoughts on this that I can take back to other non-collection staff? So like an overhead scanner, like a book scanner kind of situation? Yeah. Like, okay. That's the feeling. Um, yeah, it's, that can work fine. And essentially, it's, the, and that orientation, the scanner is, is like a scanning back on, uh, you know, an older style camera. Um, and so it can collect in information that you need um, in, in probably with relatively good pixel resolution. Um, you know, with scanners, I'm always thinking about contact with the subject. So it doesn't sound like this is a problem with that if it's like mounted overhead, for example. Um, if it's something that you already have in place, um, then maybe that, that can be valuable, but it's going to be limited on where that can go. So it's that, that scanner can only live like that. You can't take it off and take a, a different orientation image, for example. Um, but the resolution might be a challenge as well, but that should be information that's available to you. So you can compare that resolution to what you might be able to get with a new camera and, and maybe use that as an example of whether it would be good to get a new camera or whether that's sufficient or not, depending on what the use of that image is. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, someone, this is an interesting question I bet a bunch of people have run into. It says, our DSLR is older and only 3 MP. Is it acceptable to use an iPhone 8 with 12 MP fixed aperture for informational images and condition report surveys? So I bet that happens to a lot of people that, you know, they may have invested in a camera a bunch of years ago, and now, you know, like, the, I know the cameras and phones aren't anything compared to a true good camera, but sometimes they might be. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that it's true that our phones are probably going to have better imaging capabilities than a lot of the older cameras that might be around. Um, so again, you can compare the pixel resolution and then the the results as well. You might have some image distortion that happens with the iPhone pictures, but if that's not uh, critical, then it probably is better to take it with the phone, and then you actually have more flexibility because you can hold it overhead. Um, you know, I think that that also could be an argument. You know, that can be taken to the institution that more, you know, more investment is needed in this this camera because it's so old that my phone is better than it. You know, um, sure. You know, again. Depending on the use of that image, the, the iPhone picture is on often enough. Yeah, I think sometimes for a basic photo, I mean, I know sometimes when I, because I'm a, in another life, I was a contract registrar who would travel places to go do condition reporting. And um, for basic photos, I have a good camera, but there's been times when I've had it only, and I've used my iPhone camera, which is pretty good, and it's worked out fine for a basic condition report. Um, so I think sometimes it just depends on what you kind of have access to. Yeah, and if it's like this is what this object looks like, um, here's a, a picture of it, you know, that, um, if it's just an email, for example, that can be very useful. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, someone's asking for any advice for the best photographing when it comes to textile objects, such as clothing. Do you have any, like, tips when it comes to doing that kind of photographing? I mean, I would I treat textiles sort of like works on paper, so shooting from above, um, you know, treating those as, as flat subjects. Um, and so the size can be a real challenge, and um, I've had some success with, like, a splint table set up um, for, like, large tapestries, for example, but the um, splint tables can be a real challenge to get everything to be level. Um, it, I guess if there's a specific question, like whether it's about exposure or um, orientation or handling, um, then I can answer that, but I'm not sure if, if that was enough information. No, I think that's, I've always heard of slant boards as well, but you're right, they can be a little problematic, you know what I mean, when dealing with them. So um, someone's asking for a bit of clarification. She said, did I hear correctly that targets are no longer sold through AIC? I'm only finding the large color checker passport. Yeah, AIC, those ones have been discontinued. They were sold by Rob Myers for a while, but um, I think it was just a challenge to um, make it economically feasible. So I haven't tried out the new one that he's launched, um, which is not at the AIC website. It's at Rob Myers' website, which is on the screen. Um, the large color checker passport, so there's, there's kind of two things. So x ray sells they bought Great Tag Make Fast, so they sell all those color checkers. So you can get like a large one that's about eight and a half by eleven. You can get really big ones, but the passport is something that's like rectangular and it's about four by five, um, and it folds up. Um, and that is about a hundred dollars. Um, and I, I have one of those, and you can use it for profiling as well. But I buy that from BNH, which is a photo supply company. It's made for photographers, um, not through AIC. Uh, someone goes on to ask, do you recommend white balancing before taking the image, or can you do it post-processing? I'm wondering if there is a difference in accuracy or efficiency with one or the other. I think it's more efficient to capture, the, like to set the white balance before you capture, uh, so that you don't have to make adjustments in post-processing, and that just reduces the steps, for example. You, you, you don't have to white balance. 
but there's not really a difference in quality in post-processing white balance as long as you have a um, color checker in there and that it has enough pixels in order to white balance off of. Um, it's just another step that you have to do that you could avoid if you had done it ahead of time. Uh, someone also recommended that you do a whole series of webinars, C to C care, going more in depth with everything. So <laughs> I would say there's a lot to go in depth then too. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Well, I was going to say for everyone, just so you know, um, on the evaluation link that you'll see on the left hand side of the screen, when you complete that, which we always appreciate that, if you have suggestions for other webinars for C to C care to do. Uh, feel free to put ideas like that in there. Uh, talking about other training, someone had posted it early on, uh, where would one look for in-person training on collection photography? Now, I know, you know, obviously, there's all sorts of fun travel restrictions we're all dealing with right now, but, but kind of were there other places that did in-person training that you had heard about, or was it mainly online, or is it stuff you've just kind of learned during your career? Um, I don't know of any in-person like things that are available all the time. Um, I know there are workshops given, like um, Dan Cashel and JJ Chen have given them at Buffalo, and I, I travel to institutions and give them, and I know um, there's some other collection photographers who, who do that, like sort of as, as a as needed basis, and at some meetings we've done those. Um, but I think it's something that's really lacking is, is more, more training in, in this subject. As for where I learned it, I would say definitely graduate school, you know, training under Dan Cushell really uh, changed my life in a lot of ways, but I've also kept up that interest in imaging um, in my practice. I worked for Paul Messier for a long time and um, worked on some um, targets for UV visible fluorescence, so it just kind of became a part of my life um, over time and something that I really enjoy doing, and I, you know, I consider it important to my conservation career and documentation is really paramount in what we do, so I, it's something that I value highly. Yeah, I think it's one of those things that the folks I've known who are really into it were really good at it, but it, it they, they kind of learned kind of like what you were talking about. They either found like, a, like kind of I guess a mentor person who did it. Um, or if they happened to hear about a workshop, they ran and kind of learned as much as they possibly could. Mm -hmm. um, another question people are asking about is a little bit about 3D objects. Uh, someone's talking about how the biggest issue they have is high gloss, dark colored 3D objects. And someone else mentions imaging 3D objects. Are there any pitfalls or settings to keep in mind when shooting them? So do you have any thoughts on 3D objects in general? Yeah, so high gloss, black, Objects that sounds like a nightmare. Um, you know, those are inherently challenging. Um, so, and any sort of limitations you already have in your setup are going to be amplified by that because it's going to reflect back at the camera. So, if you can't control external lighting, for example, that's going to cause more reflections. So, like the first thing I would do is make sure that the only reflections you have to deal with are the actual lights you need to, to document it. Um, and then, you know, consider moving those lights in maybe a non-traditional orientation uh, to reduce reflections, uh, perhaps using a polarizer in order to reduce reflections on the surface. And then that, that will be a case where maybe you don't want a softbox because you're just making the reflection bigger. Um, I know I talked about softboxes being really useful, but that would be one example where maybe it's not that useful. Um, but you could also consider just um, that part of what you're documenting is the, is that black, the fact that it's reflective, so you can accept sort of some reflections in the image as long as it's not obscuring information that you need. Um, and then the other question was about ISO in settings, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and so uh, white balance is going to be dependent on your light source. So the white balance for 3D objects is going to be sort of the same as for 2D. You want to have that target in the image or the white balance set ahead of time um, because the, the white balance is going to be tied to the, the light source. Um, and then for exposure, the aperture is the most critical component for 3D objects. Um, and so you, I talked about F8 and F11 being the center of the lens, so they're the sharpest. Um, for something that has a lot of dimension from front to back, 
as you're photographing it, you might want to um, change the aperture so that you basically can get more in focus. And so F16, for example, might have more in focus, but if your lens only goes to F22, um, closing it all the way down like that might not be that helpful because you might have a trade-off with some flaring. So um, for 3D objects, sometimes if you can't get the whole thing in focus and you need to get the whole thing in focus, sometimes the best solution is to take multiple pictures and then in post processing you blend those together so that all the planes can be in focus. Great, thank you. <laughs> thank you, I appreciate it. Um, well, it is almost 3.30, shockingly enough. So I'm going to go ahead and say uh, close out this webinar for now. Um, we are going to try to grab the chat, because that has been interesting for some people to kind of go through. Uh, plus, if you look over on the side of the links area, you'll see the resources, the evaluation link, and I uploaded the evaluation slides while you were presenting. So if anyone wants to grab those now, you can. Again, this uh, webinar was recorded. So we will be posting that, plus all the other resources, the slides, and everything else on the ConnectingToCollections.org website, probably by early next week at the latest. Um, I want to say a huge thank you to Jennifer for taking some time today. This is a lot of information, and a lot of information I think a lot of people are grateful for, again, because it's kind of you learn it when you can get access to it. So we really appreciate it. And also thanks to FAIC, um, IMLS for supporting this program and Learning Times for doing the production. Jennifer, do you have anything to add for the rest of today? Um, I don't think so. If there are more questions in the chat that didn't get answered, I'm happy to answer those and send them out. Great, thank you. Yeah, I'm going to grab, like I said, we'll grab the chat transcript and I can send it to you to take a look at as well if you see anything because it has everyone's names. Well, thanks again, Thank everyone. So um, we will be back in October for both the course and also for the free webinar that are happening. So please keep an eye on all of our fun uh, websites, social media platforms for announcements on that. And hope everyone stays safe and healthy. Thanks again. <laughs>